welcome one and all and I hope, I hope you're having a great day and nice and warm out here in the barn which is great. But um, I'm just going to have you a, a quick chat about um, the whole concept around the importance of, of, of breeding objectives and, um, and I suppose the basis to that is uh, the experience we've had going into the market in the beef industry with the Breadwall Fedwall project. So basically what I'm going to have a chat to you about is the how critical a breeding objective is to sort of set your goals and, and set a plan in your beef operation. And in part in doing that, I'm going to sort of go back to the drawing board and ask you a few questions and reveal some of the data that we've been collecting out of the Breadwall Fedwall beef workshops that we've done in the last year or so. And the reason that I'm starting off with this, this discussion around breeding objectives is you've probably had other presentations today talking about lots of the different technologies that are available to breed better animals, um, genomics and the like, and, and I'm sort of on record as saying, well, we've got enough technology in the beef industry to fly to the moon as far as the animals we can breed genetically. The problem is we've forgotten to take the industry along for the ride. And uh, the reason behind that is I'll show you in some of the information that were outlined, but we're here today to refine your bull buying strategies to ensure you're buying the best bull for your business. Why would yours be highlighted? Because I'm a greeter and I'm a beef producer. Nathan's down at Colac, he's a beef producer. You know, aren't we all doing the same thing? Why would it be saying to, you know, refine your decisions to buy the best bulls for your business? Why is your highlighted, you reckon? Yeah, why do we have slightly different objectives to Grace? Fair enough. You keep going, you're going great. Based on? Your goals. And what would inform your goals? What are the things that would impact upon what's, what makes the right animal for you, in inverted commas? Possibly different target markets. Different target markets, Ron, is one. So you might have completely different specifications and markets you're targeting. What's the other area that's critical in, in, in informing your breeding objective? Because the first one people always throw up is your target market. What else could be really critical in informing what's the right animal for you to farm? Your environment, your location, and in particular how you run the breeding female. So we've had a bit of a howling drought in northeast Victoria, as parts of New South Wales have had, yet I've got some neighbours that their cows still haven't come under condition score three. Yet some of our cows have had to work quite hard through that period of time. So what type of animal do you need to function in your circumstance and, and what's the market you're chasing, what's your time of turn off? All these things inform what's right for your operation. So if I quickly ask you when selecting bulls, so you're going to have to be quick here to fit into the time frame of the session. When you're selecting bulls, how do you do it? Press A if you do it based on how the bull looks. B on how he looks plus some raw data. C how he looks plus breeding values. D is breeding values only, or E, someone else does your bull selection. I want you to be honest. If, you, if these bulls, which Rod would like us to sell a couple of these bulls today, and they've already lied down sleeping on the job, they're that quiet, how would you go about selecting them? So I'll rule it off there. This is a, a critical question I want to ask you. Do you have a goal or, or an ideal cow written down for your herd? We call it a written breeding objective what you want the cow to weigh, what age and weight you want to turn the calves off, you know, what you wanted to carve a two-year-old, 90% preg rate and a six-week joining. Have you written this down and defined what you actually want in your herd? Yes or no? So I'm sure I shouldn't really be there. She's a black or white question, this one. And then the last one, do you refer to or use the relevant percentile bands report to inform your bull selection? Now, for some of you, if you don't have an idea what I'm talking about, which a percentile band report is what we're going to go through as part of this activity, if you've never seen or used one of them, you've got to press no. If you regularly refer to that for your breed, which is basically benchmarking where the animals sit for their EBVs against the population of animals in that analysis, if you're using that regularly to inform, press yes. If you're not, press no. So what I wanted to do as an introduction to this session is a quick outline, but I needed to ask you some questions before I told you this data. 
So basically, just like today, about 70% of commercial beef producers, we've had a thousand to Breadwell Federal so far, are using EBVs as part of their bull selection. By the end of the workshop, basically everyone is. What's interesting though, in order to use any tools, whether it's breed plan, visual, genomics, any of the information, the most critical thing is to have a written breeding objective. And only 15% of the thousand people have got a written breeding objective. So from this day on, you're not allowed to buy another bull until you've got that on paper, like a couple in the front row have here that have been to a couple of these workshops. Because when you rock up at the sale, what are you actually buying based on? We've got to have a plan before we get there. And part of informing that plan is using that tool we just showed you around the percentile band. Um, and what's happened is as a result of not having a defined game plan, even though 70% of people say they're using breed plan, when we ask them what they want to improve most and compare that to what they're going out and selecting on, we're finding quite a degree of mismatch. And the mismatch is occurring because they're not having a defined goal and then putting their goal and their game plan into action. So by game plan, I mean you've sorted the catalogue, worked out which animals meet your breeding objective, then get there and visually appraise them. So people are saying, for example, they want to improve, for example, in this case, reproduction and weaning percentage, yet very little emphasis is put on that in their selection, even if we added that and fat together. People didn't mention calving much, yet 50% of the use or the emphasis on the data is in that. And that's okay if that's what your priority is. But we just need to make sure your goals and your game plan, as in your bull selection game plan, is tight. Because otherwise you'll end up with this mismatch. Okay, so what I'm matching is, is what they've told us they want to do with what they actually do do. The point is, for each individual, if they're the top two or three things, and you go out and act on that, that means your goals and your game plan are aligned. But for most farmers, they're not. And in a further evidence that we've got really impartial and poor use of breed plan in the industry as a tool is Ipsos did a massive review for MLA interviewing a thousand beef producers, stud and commercial, and a heap of sheep producers. And one of the parts of their study was they looked at website usage. So part of the way of executing your breeding objective is going online and searching for the bulls or letting your fingers do the walking as they say. Well, interestingly, in this market research, and this is one of their slides, so I'm not expecting you to read all this detail, it's just cut and paste out of the Ipsos report, and I'm focusing on the use of the database to find animals, you'll find that in the seed stock industry, 72% 70, of the industry were as aware of the breed plan site. In the commercial industry, this has been around since 1980, one in three beef producers knew the site existed. 6% of commercial beef producers were going online to search for bulls with a technology that's been around since 1980. Yet if we look at the sheep industry, we've got nearly 100% awareness of the sites and you've got 54% in lamb plan going online searching for their rams and believe it or not in Merino Select it's 60%. So you've got tenfold difference in the use of the technology. And the core reason for that is because 10 years ago as a sheep industry we put a heap of emphasis based on market research that no one had breeding objectives, people weren't effectively using the tools and we changed our tack. And Breadwell Federal Sheeps now had nearly 4,500 commercial sheep producers through it and that's what's leading to this backdrop. Whereas the beef industry has brought out this technology and for some reason, uh, and I think a lot of it's back to how it's been extended, is the core thing, the first move is you must have a written breeding objective. So out of this list you get to pick one. What is it that you would like to improve most in your cattle? Is it improved pregnancy rates, less calving difficulties, higher weaning percentage, faster growth rates, better carcass traits, improved temperament, structure or doing ability, which I define that as the ability of the breeding female to maintain her performance under less than optimal nutrition. So what is it that you want to improve most? And I need you to have a quick go. Okay, so a bit of emphasis in this reproduction area, uh, if we accumulate those together. 
always a lot of interest on growth and carcass. So you've kind of got this broad spectrum of interest across there. And what we talk about in Breadwell Fedwell is picking four or five key traits and combining them in a balanced way to achieve your goals. So quite interesting. So we're, we're certainly looking for, for um, well, in the sheep world, we'd say a dual purpose animal, but an animal that's um, got more than one string to its bow. And what are we trying to achieve genetically is we're trying to turn all our inputs into this great output. And what, what I'm actually smiling about is not too many of you put growth. There's been many days I've ran this workshop and 70, 80% of the audience will say we want more growth. And us blokes in particular, without being sexist back on us males, one of the things when people ask us, what do you want in your breeding objective? We always say we want more, more of everything, more growth, more of this or that. And what we're trying to do is most efficiently convert our inputs into these outputs. And often what happens in the beef industry is blokes in big hats like measuring big bulls with big butts and they join the dots from big bulls to big beef production. Yet they forget the jewel in the crown that provides half the genetic merit plus the maternal environment is the breeding female. And that's why as an industry we're putting out a call to the people that are fed income about giving you good information is to start measuring these girls more. How regularly they carve, do they carve unassisted, all that information. And then we've got to get an industry to, to, to really lap that up and use it. So the key messages out of this session are a clear written breeding objective is the critical first step to selecting and breeding the right cattle. And right is defined by you. The animal must be fit for farm and fit for market. It's going to include an emphasis on key traits to have a balanced high performing animal. Because one of the things is, is interesting if I go back to this diagram, Genetics has been sold that it's sold as a tool to drive production. You know you can use genetics just as much to control cost of production. So it doesn't have to be that it's the highest growth animal that will make you the most money. In fact, there's really good research of which I'll show you some of the slides, depending on your environment and what you're doing, that it could be a balance of different traits that are critical to impact on things like maintenance costs, amount of supplementary feeding, labour requirements. So you can use genetics to drive production, but you can also use it to control cost of production. And once you've got your plan written down, you're absolutely going to have to combine the best of the visual and the best of the objective information to achieve your goals. And when we consider the things under genetic control, there's a lot of outcomes that the cow of the future could have. Early age puberty, easier calving, better muscling, faster growth, greater yield, improved temperament. Shorter gestation, higher or lower milk production, better teat and udder structure, optimise the mature cow weight, greater IMF, higher weaning percentage, on goes the list. And which traits are for you depend on you, your production system and your target market. <coughs> and why else have I also put on this little diagram when we're thinking about genetics, why have I put the crystal ball up here? Why would we have the crystal ball up here when it comes to genetics? Okay, so that's part of it. So we're only controlling the dad in this discussion today, so that's a fair point. I'm more thinking about the time horizon. So how long the bull you buy this season, how long would you like him to last? Being, you know, not wishful but realistic. How many joinings? You want six? I reckon you, you're probably a bit above average. Three up the back. So we'll average that out at three up there, we'll say four. So we want four years out of the bull. How long would you like the daughters to last on average? Six or, six or eight years? He wants 12? Jeez, you're going to sharpen your pencil there. there. So, so basically the bull we buy today is having an impact on your herd for 20 years. If you, if you add that up. And longer. Minimum of 20 years, Malcolm said. How long do you reckon our current beef producer, commercial beef producer, based on our market research, how long do you reckon the average beef producer is spending on that 20-year decision? I want you to be candid. How long do you reckon? Two hours. <laughs> Two hours on a 20-year decision, and which traits are for you is a really critical medium to long-term decision that sets the foundation of your operation. So, so far I've told you two or three things. About one in ten, two in ten beef producers have a written breeding objective. 
Most of them are spending two hours to buy their new balls each year and they're rocking up and trying to start at lot one at the sale and get out of the pen at lot 100 all in two hours as well as eat a steak sandwich, register, say good day to your mates, say good day to the bull breeder and then sit down and make a 20 year investment. We are treating gene harvesting in the beef industry with contempt. And while 6% of beef producers are going online and searching for their bulls, we've got impartial adoption of what is a fantastic tool. A thousand commercial beef producers were interviewed by Ipsos nationally. 6% of them are aware and go online and search for their bulls. That tells me we've got a problem with something that's been around since 1980. I'll be up front and I'll be up front in front of the camera. This is why we've got this problem. We have an industry with denial in this area. I didn't do the survey. It, it's we're one of the biggest market research companies in the nation. So what we've got to do is when we're, when we're buying jeans is we've got to remember what we're buying. And all we're buying is what's swinging between his legs and a mobile delivery system to produce more profitable cattle. Yeah, this is, yeah, this is where we've got a problem. Because what influences how this animal performs? I don't have time to play this out, but we all know that, that the seed stock producers are pretty good feeders and they want to present their animals, fair enough. We know that age impacts on the weight of the bull on the day of the sale. We know the dam age impacts, whether it's a single or a twin impacts. How they're being managed as far as worms and disease and all that's left over is their genetics. And all of this is just fairy floss. Yeah. What we're, what we're seeing on sale day, based on market research, out of sales of ones that you would know in this state that are providing all the information, 70% of the value of the bull is governed by the weight of the bull on the day of the sale. 70%. And if we focus in on that and we say, where are we at in this relationship to environment and genetics? Well, basically in the beef industry, most of the genes you're dealing with are of medium heritability. You've only got two that are anywhere near wool cut and, and micron sheep industry wise, and that's gestation length and yield, where more than half of the outcome is set by the genetics. So in other words, you can take a raw measurement and read a lot into it. But for medium and lower heritability traits, you need a system that separates things like how they're fed, their age and all that from what the genetic component is. And growth is a classic. So what I want to show you is two of the sales that were in that market research are both outlined on this slide. They're both Angus sales. And what I've got is the relationship between EBV for 400 day growth and the actual body weight of the bulls. Now what's interesting is out of these sales, based on the analysis, 70% of the value of the bulls was based on their raw body weight. So lesson one for our industry, number one, I no longer go to a ram sale, I haven't been to one for five years plus where the raw body weights of the rams are presented. So if any of you are bull sellers, you've got to stop feeding garbage to people because that's what your bulls are being traded on, on fat bulls. We've got to get into the world where we're no longer presenting raw data at sales because it's extremely misleading. 400 day growth is 23% heritable. So that means 77% of the outcome in this raw body weight of these animals is nothing to do with genetics. Yet that's what we're presenting at the sale and that's what people are focusing on when they're buying. And the point of this slide is to show you this. A plus 80 bull at 400 for Angus is breed average. Across these two sales, I could buy an Angus bull that's 500 kilos or I could buy an Angus bull that's 1,000 kilos with no genetic difference in their potential to grow yet based on their age and how well they're fed is doubled the body weight on offer but not doubled the merit. Halfway. That's making me feel good. So, that does depend on the reliability of the Yep, that's, that's part, of the, part of the discussion and, and one of the things absolutely in espousing this, what we've got at the moment is plenty of information and a lack of use and what we want is more drive from commercial people to put more pressure on people to measure, do their things with discipline. But accuracy is something that, that I'm happy to talk about more, but I don't have a heap of time in, in this preso, but for sure. And in a breed like Angus, where you've got a huge global population of animals being measured, there's no excuse for accuracy. Um, so I want you to absorb this slide. I'm telling you that 
the, the average growth Angus balls traded in, in the same spring could be anywhere from 500 to 1,000 kilos. Yet old mate's rocking up and buying this 1,000 kilo bull and the man's on the rostrum and he's saying, look at him, look at his, look at his length, look at his weight, look at how round he is. And they're wrapping all this up into a big fat package and he's breed average for growth, let alone all these other traits. I want you to have a clear written breeding objective and use the best of the visual and objective information. And we need to define our breeding objective so we have an animal that's fit for farm and suitable for market and then drive genetic gain through buying better bulls and use your joining pressure on your cows and your heifers to really drive that fertility in your herd. So if I cover a little bit of this and, um, and, and then we'll stop and have a look at the bulls. But we want females that, as Ron said this at the start, he said we want them to reproduce unassisted without high maintenance cost. If that's your shopping list to be fit for farm, then you've got to go out and select on traits that are going to deliver that. And unfortunately, you can't look at bulls on face value and tell you that. You can't actually look at a bull visually and tell us how fertile his daughters are going to be. The traits that are most useful for that is days to calving, and it's a trait that tells us basically the animal's ability to carve in a 365-day interval and a more positive EBV implies they're blowing out and taking longer. A more negative EBV means they're more fertile and they're coming back and rebreeding sooner. There are other traits that impact on it, but that's the most critical one. And if I show you one slide out of the beef CRC research, which had bulls that varied from top 10% for days to calving, so highly fertile, breed average, through to animals that were positive to days to calving, so lower fertility. Their daughters were either joined for nine weeks or six weeks. And you might be sitting there today saying, I want at least 90% pregnancy rate. That'd be fair enough. Well, if you've got breed average genetics, you'll get 90% preg rates on a nine week joining based on this trial that was done. But if you want to get them in calf in six weeks and get 90% preg rate, you need top 10% for fertility. If you're going to be out in these animals here that are blowing out in days to calving, regardless of, even in either of these good commercial joining lengths, you'll get nowhere near 90% preg rate. So if you want fertility, you've got to go out and select for it. Another one that the same trial looked at was the role of fat. And basically the message from this slide is you should select for fat, you get fat. And so what they've done is, is measure the fat depth on the animals throughout their lifetime. And these as females as first, second, third and fourth carvers. What was interesting is when we looked at this trial and the reason there's four lines there is the, the if I go back one, this is the genetically high fat line against the genetically low fat line run under high nutrition and then it was repeated under low nutrition. And at all times the green lines are fatter. Okay, if you select for fat you get fat. But there was three or four other key messages out of this research. Early in life, the high fat lines had a 14% higher pregnancy rate than the low fat line. Fat is a critical switch for fertility. Right, second thing. The first year they went to sell the steers, when they were up to weight, they sold them. About 30% of the low fat cattle got hit for not meeting specification for fat. They were grass finished. The next year they said, right, oh, we'll, we'll grow these steers out until they've got adequate fat. Then what happened is a heap of the low fat line animals got hit for dentition because they took too long to get enough fat cover. So I've just given you three examples of where seriously going out and just selecting for growth, big, late maturing, lean animals can burn a hole in your pocket. It gives you growth, but it doesn't give you fertility or finishing ability. So keep an eye on the balance of your animals. We want a balanced, high-performing animal, not a one-hit wonder. Um, I don't have time to go through all these in detail, but we know there's an unfavourable correlation between all the growth traits and birth weight, and that's why people like Rod are measuring birth weight on their bulls and growth rate and trying to find animals that buck that standard correlation. So if you want less dystocia, you'll have to select for lower birth weight better calving, ease, direct and in daughters. Um, another one that was thrown up there for fit for farm was lower mature size. The main message out of this slide is if you're going to select on growth rate late in life, like 600 day weight, 
inadvertently you'll get bigger females because the correlation between 600 day weight and final size is about 0.8. So in other words, you've got a two in 10 chance to find an animal that's high for growth at 600 and moderate mature. Whereas if you push your growth rate selection back to earlier in life, say 400 day weight, you double your chance to find animals that are good at that growth stage, but then starting to plateau off. So it's about managing this land to compromise. Know when you're selling your cattle and hone in and select for that, as well as keeping an eye for the daughters and when you want them to perform. I don't have a lot of time on eating quality, but Mick Crowley earlier today will have talked ad nauseum about that. Know your market, know if there's specification and reward for doing that. And even if you're selling into a, a feedlot, don't think that you're just selling the cattle and they've got no interest in marvelling. I've sold them for over 20 years to Rangers Valley and they've got us all ranked. They know exactly where your cattle sit for growth in the feedlot, carcass quality, survival, all these things. So keep an eye on, on, on the end of the value chain. Who's crossbreeding? I reckon this is one of the most underutilised cards in the beef industry big time. And, and I think one of the key reasons is hybrid vigour is one of the great opportunities in the beef industry. And one of the core reasons why there's not a lot of people crossbreeding, if I'd be up front, from the from a bit of work research I've seen done on it, it's primarily been sold as the way to maximise hybrid vigour is to take the two most unrelated breeds, like put a Kianina on an Angus, or take a dairy cross female and join it to a limousine. So you've got little Heinz variety here, it's got maximum hybrid vigour, okay, and there's three breed cross, but the most beef producers are spooked by that for a range of reasons, like things like consistency, calving ease, fertility, market access to their animals, all this stuff. So the really underutilised card in our industry is complementary crossbreeding, where you take two breeds, just to be old fashioned, like a Hereford and Angus, or, or a Red Short on an Angus, and you cross them, you don't quite get maximum hybrid vigour, but you maintain um, a lot of the traits that allow you to keep the, the F1 female. You also maintain, in most cases, if you're using the right genetics, market access. So crossbreeding is an underutilised card. And the last thing I want to say about it is this breed analogy and everything happening under breed in the beef industry is killing us. Like if I surveyed Angus producers that are using a black simmental at the moment, I'll say, why are you using them? They'll say to lift growth rate, lift growth rate. Well, it turns out from the top 1% to the bottom 1% on the simmental percentile band, there's 60 kilos of variation. So you know that cross on average will give you about a 10% lift in calf weaning weight. So let's say about 30 kilos on average based on the hybrid vigour. Yet there's 60 kilos of opportunity you're leaving on the shelf if you do it that transaction on breed only. I buy this breed because it gives me this. And there's a heap of Brahmin breeders in Queensland saying I'm using an Angus bull to give me eating quality. Well, from top 1% to bottom 1%, there's no other breed with bigger variation in IMF. So which bloody Angus are they using? This one or this one? So it's no different with your crossbreeding as to your self-replacing operation is you've got to have a plan and you need to use the tools to go out and select for the animals that will deliver your goals. Don't just do it on a breed basis because there's real opportunity with crossbreeding and it's one of the areas where the sheep industry is leaving us for dead in the beef world is because they'll go and grab genes for a purpose. A two breed cross will give you around that 10% increase as I said in calf weight um, to female but it's this three breed scenario and how you blend that together where the real opportunity lies in the maternal traits. Yet the amount of crossbreeding that's going on maternally to keep the daughters is way less than this little survey we did here. Very few people are taking advantage of this opportunity and it's hard to make good money out of beef cattle and we're leaving a big card on the shelf. So I'm going to stop talking after this uh, slide and we're going to have a look at the bulls. So to be fit for farm we want a good reproduction, we don't want to be pulling calves We've got to have appropriate maintenance costs. The thing I forgot to mention about that, that work done in the CRC with fat, the additional thing to the messages about reproduction and finishing ability is over the seven or eight years they ran that trial, as soon as one animal got to score two in a treatment group, they had to commence supplementary feeding. That was the ethics approval. Which line of cattle triggered the supplementary feeding first time every time? 
was the genetically low fat line. So we've got to keep these things in mind and get the right balance. And uh, know your markets and select balls that'll do the job. And what we're going to go on to now is there's a series of basics that haven't changed. We must combine the good data with good visual appraisal. Is the bull fit, basically, reproductively sound, good structured, right temperament? If you're selecting for a market where you need butt shape, there is no EBV for butt shape. EMA is favourably correlated. But if you need muscle confirmation, you're going to have to select for butt shape visually when you're appraising your cattle. Right, now, I don't even have a chance at a normal bread well fed well rod to tell us his, his wares and what he's selecting for, but I'm going to have to skip that today. But if you've got any questions on the bulls, they'll be here till after the workshop. We've got three bulls on offer. Your money's your market, okay, today. It's all over to you. And I'm, I'm holding the information, but I want you to practice it as the industry's practicing it. And I want you to look at these three bulls and tell me, and the answer's not on the paper we just handed out, by the way. So I want you to visually look at these three bulls, and I want you to tell me which of these three bulls will throw the highest 400-day weight progeny. So you're out there, you're selecting for 400-day growth. The bulls are about 20 months old. That's all you need to know, and they're all out of one drop. You know, they're all, they're all here for your appraisal. Which lot do you want to buy? Lot one, lot two, or lot three? You want to lift the weight in your calves. We can, we can lead them around if you like. Just turn them around. Just turn them around, righto. We will need an extra leader, or I'll have to hold one. Number three. So who wants to really, look at that growth. Look at that lot three. Look at his extension. Who, hands, hands up who would like to buy lot three to lift the growth rates. <coughs> yep. and, and visually, I would have been leaning that way. Okay, so he, he sold well. You knocked him down for five or six thousand up the end there. Okay, which other animal would you select him for the growth rates? This fella up the end here, big boy. Yep, show of hands on him. Look there, wow, look at them all sleeping there. About eight grand on that one. Okay, and the fella in the middle's been left behind. Now, what do you know by design for the activity? Um, he's the high growth bull, and I'm about to re reveal how and why. So uh, what I've just handed you is a percentile band report. Now, half of you told me you have seen and used these for your breed, and that's great. That's probably the highest I've ever recorded before. But if that's the case, that's good. Up the top, it's telling you that it's a recent run date done in May 2019. It's for Herefords, and that's what we're looking at. And it's got all the traits listed, and then down the left-hand side is the bands. Now... Breed average is around the 50th percentile. So what was the trait that I said that we were going to select on these bulls? What did I say? 400 day growth. What's breed average for a Hereford? 400 day growth. 54. Well, the bulls in here aren't that big a spread. They basically vary from 58 to 62. Um, but the bull up the top here is the lowest for growth and he made the highest price. Now, you're going to think that that was a pretty rough and ready, and there's only four kilos of difference between the top and the bottom. But the point is, he made the most votes. You know why? Because the oldest and his raw body weight is at least 50 kilos heavy in the next, and it's 100 kilos heavy in the youngest one. Not one of you said, well, how old are these bulls, and what's the age spread? And that's ex Guess what I said? I guess what I said? It's one of the worst sayings in this industry. The worst sayings comes from the pointy end of the merino world. They're all out of one drop, son. You should be able to pick them. Yeah, I said they're all about 20 months and they're all out of one drop. So let's keep this challenge going because I want you to go home and you can think I'm a bugger and that's fine. But I want you never to make this mistake again because what's happening on sale day is the reason that these blokes are making the most is not because they're necessarily the best, it's because they're the heaviest. And that's what our market research is telling us. 70% of the sale value of the bull is based on the weight of the bull on the day of the sale. But you have a birth on yep. So and how many people are correcting for that? Because what our analysis is telling us, you just line them up from fattest, from heaviest to lightest, and three quarters of the sale value on the haver is governed by the weight of the bull on the day of the sale. That's what the market research is telling us. So you're doing that, but the average person is not doing that. They're just buying fat bulls. 
And the reason they're buying fat bulls is first and foremost is the bull weight should not be there. We have to progress as an industry. I never go to a ram sale now, I can't think of one where I've been to, to look at rams where raw body weights are presented. It's 23% heritable, so three quarters of it is nothing to do with genes. So start focusing in on what you're looking for. And the same person that says, son, you should be able to pick them, they're all out of one drop, they'll also say things like, you should be able to see profit. You should be able to see growth rate. Well, how do we correct for the fact that one of these is a twin? How do we correct for that with our little mental arithmetic on the run? Could be a twin out of a heifer, whereas the other two are singles out of five or six-year-old cows. Perhaps not far from the truth. So... It turns out that this fella in the middle, the lowest frame score bloke, is the highest for growth at plus 62. And he's out of a heifer. You can't see it. How are you going to calculate that on the run? We've either, we have got to the point basically in the beef industry with breed plan where we either chuck it out or decide to keep it. Because it is being treated with contempt. Two hours on a 20 year decision and the average farmer is not using one of the best tools that's available. So, and, and I'm not getting cranky with you about it, I'm really cranky as an industry with how we've extended it. Because the number one thing with genetics is a written, clear breeding objective. Know what you want to achieve and then go and use the tools for, to fulfil that. So what about for fat? We want to put some fat cover into our cattle pretend. We're, we're up in Mansfield, tough season, high stocking rate. We're at Rod Manning's farm. We need to put a bit of fat in their veins. He's running double the district average stocking rate. I didn't tell Rod I was going to use him in my preso. But the animals have got to have the ability to, to carry and meet the condition score targets to get in calf, get back in calf again. So which of these bulls is best for fat, do you reckon? Turned out, by the way, that, the, that this bull was plus 58 for 400 day weight. Just tell me on the percentile band where he's up to. Sorry, I'm having to do this much quicker than you. What, where he's about top 35 and the bull in the middle that won the day is plus 62 for 400 days so what's that what bands that put him on top 20 so out of all of the Herefords measured in this analysis this fellow's in the top 20 uh, there is so outstanding so for fat which animal would be leaning for because we go from the top 15 to the bottom 5% of the industry in three bulls. So you've nearly got the whole Hereford industry here in three bulls. So which one? You want to put some fat cover on? We'll do it on rump fat. I'll base it on rump fat. Measured back over here. So which bull is the leanest? Which bull's the fattest? Lot one, lot two, lot three. Lot two. You liking lot two? Put a bit of fat on them. Who's up for lot two? I talked him up before, so there's four or five grand there. It's pretty hard to pick, and if you're sitting there thinking this bloke's having a lend of us, um, I'm just trying to practice with you what's happening in the industry. It's measured by an ultrasound screen under the skin in millimetres, so unless you've got x-ray vision, stop trying to guess it. Use the information that's provided. If you want fat in your breeding objective, because that's what you've chosen for, use the data to help you to select for that. So in the last five minutes, um, before you hammer me with questions, I'll reveal where they're at. So the leanest bull in the catalogue at minus 1.1 for fat is this bloke here. Where's minus 1.1 for fat? Bottom lowest five, right? Whereas the bloke in the middle is plus 1.6 for fat. Where's that put him? Top 15. Huge variation. Could you see that with your eye? Once again, the oldest bull has had more chance to get further into his middle age spread. So as you get closer to maturity, no need to get that on camera, Jason. As you get closer to maturity, you start to lay off more spread. You start to lay off a bit more around the girth. And that's exactly what this boy's doing. So old mate stands on the rostrum and he says, look at what you're buying. Look at his doing ability. It's just older. Had more chance to mature and fill his pants. Whereas this fella is a bit younger. He's out of a heifer. Still really good fat cover relative to his whole body size, but you don't see it because it doesn't jump out and smack you in the face because he's not the biggest one for sale on the day. So um, 
There's variation here also in IMF, but you would be sincere enough if intramuscular fat was in your objective. I think you'd say, well, I can't see that. And what I'm trying to say to you for growth, muscle, fat, mature cow weight, all these traits are moderately heritable, where 70 to 80% of the raw outcome is governed by things that are non-genetic. So once you're in that game, you need to start leaning on the data. Does that make sense? That's all I'm saying. And if you come along to a bread wall, fed wall, what we'll do is, is we'll walk you through a written breeding objective so you have your own plan and where 15% of people are rocking up and they have one, by the end of it, everyone has one and they've got a good clear plan and they work on it with their own percentile band for their breed, which I didn't have time today, but there'll be people here that are using Angus or Charolais or whatever. If you come along to a full day, you get a chance to use it for your breed. But just in closing, Darren, is there is any questions um, for any of you, right down the bottom, 24% wanted to select on doing ability. And all I'll say about that is where these people are making the effort to scan their bulls for muscle and fat, stand still, mate. Just in here, basically, I like, like to call this uh, the fuel tank. And the correlation between the genetic component of condition score and what these people are measuring is about 0 0.7, 0 0.8. So if you want to select for a cow that's better doing, i.e. can maintain her condition score better, you need to select for more muscle and fat. Once an animal's down to condition score 2, they've only got um, muscle left to give. They've burned up all their fat. So we'll wind up, but basically it uh, depends on your breeding objective as to what's, what you need. But, um, and just as I finish, what we would do at a bread wall fed wall is then step through and couple that, visual, that data with a visual appraisal. And um, we'd make sure that the animals can walk really well. That's the number one message for you. If I said to you visually, what do you got to select for? And I've done this at many workshops, I'll say, you've got to look at the feet first, and I say, I call bullshit to that. And the reason I say that is half of them will have their feet doctored, and the other reason is it's not the greatest indicator of structural faults. The first thing you want to do is watch the animal walk, and you're looking for the back foot to land where the front foot leaves off. And if you go to the feet first in their straight hind legs, they'll have fantastic back feet because they're wearing on their toes. So assess them walking first and foremost and then get into the rest of the appraisal. Thank you.